Okay, I see that we are about uh, already 14 people in the room. So what I would suggest is that we, we get started. Um, and so um, welcome to this session. It's a two paper session um, with, you know, most likely connections between the two presentations that will, you know, come uh, with your synaptic uh, connection yourself. The big, the big theme is mixed methods uh, in evaluation and above all, you know, innovation, uh, trying to integrate different sources of data. And we have two uh, speakers today. I'm, I'm very excited about both of their uh, uh, presentation because we only have two and we have quite a bit of time. What would be great is also to, to you know, in, in between the presentation, after, um, to also hear your, your thoughts um, and, uh, and maybe your experiences with similar integration um, of, of, uh, of different mixed methods. We also have the possibility um, of having Rick spend a little bit more time on the tool that he will be presenting. Um, if you're interested, that he can walk you through some of the applications. So that's that's the beauty of having a little bit more time than the usual rush of, of many speakers. So um, what we'll do, we'll proceed in, 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 in kind of two phase. We'll start with, with Rick Davis. Um, I'm sure many of know, you know Rick and, you know, uh, trying to have a, a fully fledged bio is, would take a long time. So he can also complete what I have to say. But basically, you know, he's been in evaluation for 30 years. He's not only an evaluator, he's really a, a tool developer. Many of you might uh, know uh, him for the most significant change techniques. You might have been on his Eval C3 website where really the toolbox of evaluator is here uh, at your disposal to, to try to, to, to integrate those methods. Um, and today he will also be presenting another one one of these tools, um, which is which has a very different kind of purpose, which is uh, Power Evo. Maybe there is another way of pronouncing it, but it's to help evaluators return to the future, basically, if I understand correctly. And and I'm looking forward to Rick's uh, presentation. And then we have. Um, Olena Ribier, who is a senior program officer, and she is specializing in, in networks and coalition building. She's working for USAID and PACT, um, and will uh, and will present us with a very interesting, um, eclectic way of looking at how to assess um, the networks around a civil society organization. Um, and so, um, you know, in between again, we will have plenty of time to ask quick questions, clarify and then enter in a, in a little bit more of a, of a fully-fledged discussion. And as you come in, uh, welcome. Um, so, Rick, over to you. I would say, you know, you can take probably between 15, 20 minutes. Then we all know that our attention span starts to plummet. Um, and so um, uh, go ahead with sharing your screen, and, and, uh, and uh, we're looking forward to, to hearing from you. Okay, can I just get confirmation that everybody can see a slide uh, which says exploring and evaluating alternative futures? Could you, someone give me a shout out? Yep, absolutely, you can, we can see. Okay, so that's the, the topic. Um, and this presentation basically is the same as what I gave to the UK Evaluation Society uh, conference earlier this year. I'm reassured by the findings of the poll, which many of you completed before joining this session, uh, that in fact most of you are not familiar with Power Evo. In other words, you haven't seen this presentation before, so you won't be bored by it, hopefully. So yes, we had a poll asking two questions, just how familiar people are with scenario planning and how familiar people are with Power Evo, which is one particular approach. And I think I could briefly summarize, uh, summarize this very briefly by saying people have uh, relatively little knowledge of scenario planning and very little knowledge of Power Evo. So it's a, a sort of blank slate situation. So uh, you'll notice I've got a quote here which says 90% of problems have already been solved in some other field. You just have to find them. And I like collecting quotes. And I like this quote because it's reminding us uh, that wherever we're working, if we just lift our heads and look over the fence, we might find some useful ideas outside our field of normal field of practice. And I think uh, I'll be able to give an example here as we proceed. 
So the agenda is, this is the agenda. I'm firstly going to be talking about the relevance of the future to evaluators and vice versa, and I'll explain that. Then I'm going to be talking about the articulation of alternative futures, how you do that using this free web app called Parivo. I'm then going to move into, once you've articulated a, a range of alternative futures, how do you evaluate those? Then I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail at the, about the theory of change embedded in the design of the Parivo app. And then at the end, I'll, I'll give some, make some suggestions about how the Parivo app might develop in the future, its own alternative futures. So that's the agenda. So how do evaluators think about the future? Well, this may be a fairly limited view, but I think ma mainly evaluators are looking backwards. They're looking at what has happened and trying to make assessments of worth and identification of causal processes involved. But they also do look forward. They look forward when they're looking at a theory of change and, and how things are expected to work in the future. And they also look forward when they're thinking about the results of their evaluations and what recommendations they can make about what should be done differently and what should be continued into the future. So there's some attempt to look forward, but largely evaluation is a, a backward looking exercise. Theories of change have been an area of interest of mine for quite some time, particularly how you represent them. And these capture, to some extent, you know, these capture um, just uh, the limits and the capacities that we have at the moment. Most often you'll find uh, theories of change in a fairly simple linear form describing uh, one route into the future that the, the project or the intervention is expecting to take. In some cases you'll get a more networked uh, representation of a theory of change and in those situations what we're looking at is multiple uh, different combinations of routes that might be taken. That uh, is more accurate representation often of the future, but has its own problems, which I'll touch upon. And occasionally we get uh, theories of, of uh, change, which are in sort of systems model forms, which include complex feedback loops and maybe even function as simulations, but they are fairly rare. So that's about the evaluators looking forward. What about the other group here, which I'm interested to talk about, which are futurists. Futurists are people who specialize in thinking about the future and getting people to think about the future. And they exist as a profession that might come as a surprise, but there are at least nine academic journals which publish their findings. And um, it appears in the literature that basically not a huge amount of attention has been given to evaluation of their work. However, people are in the field are quite aware of this and they are starting to think about it. Their thinking about evaluation is largely isolated from the body of thinking that you and I will probably be familiar with. The positive thing on the rise in here is that just recently a task force on evaluation was set up by the Association of Professional Futurists and I've um, been in one of the people included in that task force and we're now trying to review the literature and lessons learnt on the evaluation of futurists work. And this uh, journal reference here is um, one summary overview of the use of evaluation by futurists. And you'll be able to see this in the presentation, which you can find on the Hoover website. So what are the, what are the problems presented by the future? Uh, they're in two forms. One is problems of articulation. Uh, we, one of the classic problems with views of the future is that they haven't been broad or diverse enough. There's a famous quotation which says, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. In other words, our, our visions of the future are too limited uh, and, and not sufficiently diverse and imaginative to cope with the reality of the future when it actually arrives on our doorstep. However, you can have too much diversity when it comes to thinking about the future, um, particularly in some more complex network versions of theories of change. The evaluation team will be struggling to know, well, we've got scarce resources. Where are we going to focus them on them given the multiplicity of causal pathways that could be at work? There are also issues about depth of detail where uh, in order to verify a theory about what's going to happen in the future, the more detail that you have, the better. But on the other hand, if you want to communicate that vision of the future to people, you need a simplified version. You don't want too much detail. 
Then there's the second problem of looking at the future, which is how do you evaluate the, the future? How do you evaluate something that has not yet happened? So we'll be looking at both of these issues as I go forward with this presentation. So in this slide here, you'll see the logo of the website, and it basically tries to capture how the PowerEvo process works. PowerEvo, as it says here, is an open source um, and I can't see the screen now because of this open source online web application for developing alternative past histories or future scenarios using a participatory evolutionary process. So it can be used to reconstruct the past as well as alternative futures. And using this diagram, I'll just explain how it works in brief. So each of these branches of this tree structure is a storyline, uh, like a, a chapter in a book. And the nodes in this diagram are paragraphs of text, one paragraph following the other, saying what happened and what happened next and what happened next. And the columns in this diagram are iterations uh, in, the, in the process of constructing these storylines. And so you can see that there's a, uh, there's a common paragraph at the beginning and then in the first column, in the first iteration, there are four different variants of that storyline built on by four, uh, built by four participants who each add a paragraph of their own. And then in the next iteration, they're invited to do the same, to add another paragraph onto the existing two paragraphs. And in some cases, um, some of the original paragraphs, like number one, get ignored. Nobody wants to build on it. In other cases, like paragraph number three, uh, two people wanted to build on that paragraph, and so the, the storyline branched into two forms. And so as you repeat this process of iteration, which is a series of steps in the, in the use of the process, in, in the way people participate, some storylines die out, some survive, and some proliferate. So storyline number three ended up branching into three surviving storylines at the end of the exercise on the right-hand side. That's a very succinct summary. And I'm now going to show you what that looks like in terms of the web interface. If I can do this. Right, so this is, I hope people can see this. I don't expect you to be able to read the text because it's quite small. But basically, this is the front page of the interface of PowerEvo when an exercise is well underway. At the top, we have guidance to the participants, which is written by the facilitator of the exercise and is updated with each iteration. On the uh, right-hand side, you'll see a number of paragraphs of text, and they are one storyline in that branching structure that you saw. Uh, they, and so it means here you can see one, two, three, four, five different paragraphs, so it's been through five iterations. And on the left-hand side, you can see a rather complicated tree structure, much more complex than the example I gave you. But highlighted in that tree structure is one storyline on the left-hand side, and that's the one we're viewing at the moment. In the storyline, you'll see also there's a little comment box where somebody has actually commented on the storyline that's been developing so far. And over on the left, there's a little evaluation box, which I'll explain a bit later on, and which enables the participants to evaluate the storylines, make evaluative judgments about the storylines. And down the bottom, there is space, which you can't see here, for where the next contribution could be added to. In this exercise, there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about 10 participants represented by the 10 nodes on the top of that uh, tree structure. And it went for eight iterations. Uh, there were eight, eight, eight opportunities for people to build on the storylines, and they are represented by those eight rows. So that's the, uh, the overall structure of the process. There are various design choices or parameters that a, a facilitator can uh, make choices about in terms of running an exercise. The basic roles that are available for people here are as a facilitator. You always need a facilitator, and you need contributors, people who will contribute the paragraphs. That's the actual core. Um, you can, or though the contributors would normally do and make evaluative judgments as well, but you could have third parties do that. And you can also have commentators, and you saw that comment facility there, and you can also have observers. 
and we can have, uh, you can vary the number of participants in the exercise you saw, there was about 10. Uh, you can vary the types of participants, they can be crowds from uh, like crowdsourcing, you can crowdsource research participants, or they can be members of an organisation, a think tank in the UK which I worked with. They can be representing themselves, their own particular views, or they can be rep representing a role, uh, taking on the role of a particular stakeholder who would have particular views, or they can be a representative of a team within their organisation. The guidance that's given by the facilitator uh, can vary from very uh, hands-off, just managing the boundaries, uh, telling people what's not allowed, but everything else is led to the contributor, left to the contributors, or the, the facilitator can take a more actively directing role. The number of iterations, I mentioned there was eight in this previous exercise, they can be varied and the time period covered by each iteration can vary. So typically in recent exercises, each iteration would represent around about six, six months or 12 months of calendar time, but that is very flexible, you can vary that. And when it comes to an evaluation, uh, you can choose the types of evaluation questions you want to ask and who the participants will be. I'm moving through this quite quickly because I'm quite mindful of the time limit and I'm hoping that's okay with everyone. Um, these are, we've carried out about, I think about 15 or 16 exercises so far. A lot of these were in pre-tests and early tests, what you might call beta tests of the, of the application, but we've looked at uh, people's view of what climate change will look like, what post-Brexit Britain would look like, what post-COVID will look like. Uh, we've looked at strategic planning processes in a think tank. We've looked at um, the Biden presidency the experiences of UN volunteers, uh, farmers' field trial experiences, uh, biotechnology risk and gender policy in the United Nations. So it's quite a range of things there. And the types of participants are ranged from 6 to 15. We've recruited these from communities of practice, staff members of a think tank, UN volunteers, you know, UN staff members and crowdsourced research participants. The number of iterations, as I've mentioned, has ran about between seven and eight on average, often tied to calendar periods, range, in ranging in terms of total duration from total two to five years. And the time period that participants contribute, the time that they contribute, uh, usually is between two to five days per iteration because people are spread around the globe and the time input they put into writing and reading the paragraphs per iteration is maybe between 30 minutes and one hour. And most of the applications have been explorations of the future, but there's been three reconstructions of histories. Um, how does it compare to other scenario planning approaches? I think probably mo one most important difference is it gen there are more scenarios, a bigger diversity of scenarios are developed in contrast to probably the most stereotypical approach to scenario planning, which is to end up with a two by two, by two matrix showing four possible scenarios in total. Uh, the, the application, the exercise you just saw there had um, uh, about 12 surviving storylines, but probably about f uh, equal number, if not more, extinct storylines. People's participation in the exercise is anonymous. That's quite important. So the focus is on people's ideas, not the identity and, uh, and of the people carrying those ideas. But it is still very much a participatory process. People are building on each other's storylines. And also the evaluation process is participatory. It involves open and closed ended questions. And we're looking both at the process of generating these storylines and the contents of those storylines. Um, evaluation takes, at, uh, takes part at different points in time. When contributors are choosing which storyline to contribute, they're making an evaluative judgment. When commenters make, commentators are commenting on specific contributions, they're making evaluative judgments. And most importantly, uh, when they're asked to, when could contributors and commentators are asked to use the evaluation facility, we're asking them questions about desirability, probability, they're, they're built into the app in that little box that you saw, but also we make use of a survey monkey questionnaire, which gives a lot more flexibility in the design of the evaluative questions. The types of evaluation questions we're looking at here, 
uh, we're asking people to identify from the surviving storylines the storylines which they think are most likely, least likely, most desirable, least desirable. And I'll explain a bit more about that shortly. We're asking to do a sort of online pile sorting exercise where they sort the storylines into two groups of any size and tell us what they think is the most significant difference between these storylines. So they're giving us their criteria of difference between the storylines. We're asking them about what is most surprising in terms of the contents there and the content which is not there. We're asking them about how optimistic or pessimistic they feel about their own storylines and those of others and the extent to which they feel they can have an influence over the events described and the extent to which those events might influence them and other questions. So, um, how are we going for t uh, time, Estelle? You, you can go for another three minutes. Right, I think I can get there. Right, so the theory of change basically is having a diversity of storylines will help us better prepare for the future. So we're not talking about forecasting, making specific predictions, but developing a range of storylines that might help us think about the future. In addition to that, we're trying to, uh, through the process of evaluation, increases people's capacity to think about the future. In other words, their, their metacognitive capacity, to get them thinking about how they're thinking about the future. And the purpose of having this platform is to run enable multiple exercises to be run in such a way that we generate lots of information which might help us achieve these two objectives. Um, I'm just wondering whether I should skip on to uh, I was going to talk about diversity as a causal mechanism and an outcome, but I'll skip that because of the time and focus on two examples of analysis of the results. This is a scatter plot where people, people's judgments about the likelihood and desirability of storylines has been plotted. And the basis here then is a discussion about what types of storylines are missing. For example, there are not many in the desirable and likely uh, square of the space. Why is that? Why are we not talking about that? What types of storylines are contested in their judgments? The red dots are storylines where the judgments about probability and desirability were conflicting, uh, and there, that there's a, a need for a discussion of those. And then when we look at the different types of the different quadrants in the in in this space, um, we 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 need different responses. Things which are most likely but undesirable are risks that need to be thought about. Things which are most desirable but less likely are opportunities that need to be th thought about. And there are other types of scatter plots that you could do in the same way, say plotting sustainability against equity. The other scatter plot here is about looking at participation, the extent to which people built on each other's storylines, whether they built on their own, whether other people built on theirs. And there are four types of participant behavior here. We've got leaders who just go ahead and make their own storylines, but some people follow them. You've got followers who don't do much in the way of charging out on their own, but are largely building on other people's storylines. We've got bridging people, people who are making, doing a bit of adding new storylines of their own, but also connecting with others. And we've got I, what I call isolates, people who are just working on their own storyline and not adding to anyone else's. So the, one of the interesting research questions here is what type of mix of participatory behavior is most useful in terms of developing a, 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 a healthy diversity of storylines? And that's an open question. Some uh, post-evaluation questions. I might just skip that because we haven't done much in this area. Um, and I'll just talk now about the futures for Parivo itself. Um, here we're looking at uh, perhaps making more use of role specialization, making more use of commentators. We've just uh, done an exercise with the UN, uh, with the UN agency where we were looking at um, the gender policy and we, we had some use of commentators uh, commenting on the storylines that we're developing. We need to do that more. Gamification options where you give people feedback on the extent to which their contributions have been built on by others. Uh, scaling up the, the numbers of people participating, extending the anonymization, and um, thinking about how we can use Parivo to design a program theory of change. I think I probably run over the three minutes, so I should stop here, I think. Yeah, right on, on the dot. Thank you, Rick. Um, great. So 
Um, you know, I, 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 I propose that we take about 10 minutes to exchange on Rick's presentation, maybe more on the you know, clarification side or, you know, uh, even like ideas on applications. Um, and uh, then we, we can take that conversation a little bit uh, on when after, um, after Olena has spoken. Um, so I see, I see that there is a, a quite some enthusiasm in the chat. If you have any questions, any thoughts, feel free to post it there. Or if you even would like to, to speak, um, please, uh, you know, I think we have a raise hand button. If you go into the people list, uh, you find your name, and then there is a little hand raising. Um, uh, that, that's totally possible as well. Um, so don't be shy if you have uh, questions or if you would like to have some clarifications. Um, as you get thinking, I personally have two questions for you, Rick. Um, the first is, is touching on exactly what you were hinting at the end, which is the composition of the people participating. And you have this nice typology of, of, of kind of uh, behavior or uh, mentality. Um, I was wondering if um, it's something that you want to find out after or if you are trying to plan for when you know setting up the the story uh, the storylines and setting up the participatory model when you invite people are you trying to somehow also have you know a, a range of possible views or it's something you can't really plan for and and you have to to think through on the ex post uh, side that was my first question my second is more of an application and I'm still trying to wrap my head around, uh, you know, what it means concretely. So maybe if you could give us one of the examples on, on one of the applications that you mentioned. I have a team in my group who is currently working on an evaluation of uh, disaster risk reduction, um, and they are trying really also to wrap their hand around scenario uh, planning, um, especially because, you know, Disasters, you, you can't really plan for them, you have to prepare, but the onset is, is unclear. So, um, you know, is, is there a way to have the platform open um, to different kind of stakeholders? How is the data visible? Is there privacy around the data? Uh, things like that. Thank you. And, uh, and I, I will monitor the, the hand raising. Is it? I think there's more than two questions. I'm teaching. <laughs> okay, I'll try and answer those. <laughs> um, in terms of, um, sorry, I've lost the plot here now. In terms of participants, right. In some situations, you have a lot of control over the participants. So a UK think tank uh, wanted to do a Parivo exercise as an input into a, a strategic planning process. There, they quite consciously chose someone from each unit in the organization, and they knew exactly what they were doing. Fine. Then you have uh, somebody doing an evaluation, and they want to do, look at, uh, they reconstruct what has happened in a, in, a, uh, in a program. There, they have a known pool of people they can contact, but who participates is a matter of those people saying, yes, I'm willing to do that. So they have some degree of control. Thirdly, I've done crowdsourcing of research participants. So you can specify, I wanted them to be in the UK because it was about a UK subject. I wanted them to be uh, resident here for some time. And I could specify certain things, uh, including a gender balance, for example. Uh, and then in addition to that, they will give you a profile on other demographic aspects of the people who have fit that, the, the boundaries that you've set up. So you've got some degree of control. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it varies according to where you're recruiting the participants from and the extent to which you're dependent on their uh, volunteering versus, you know, you have some authority to say, well, you will participate. Uh, the second question was, and uh, you wanted some examples, I think, is that right? Yeah. Um, so I think the two interesting examples, uh, one that's just happened recently, in fact, it's happened in two different UN organizations. Um, one was, um, um, I don't want to give away the identity of the organization, so I have to be careful here. Um, uh, in one was looking, one UN organization wanted an evaluation of the gender policy, policy and the extent to which it was being implemented uh, in the organization. And the person who ran the exercise, which wasn't me, 
Uh, I'm just in the background giving them tech support. Um, set up a, a situation whereby they invented a fictional character. And uh, so the first paragraph was about this fictional character who just started working in this UN organization. And the participants who were carefully recruited, but subject to being volunteers in the way that I described, they're all, participants, they're all staff members of this organization and they came from different levels of staff, different le authority levels within the organization. They, were, they had to develop storylines about what happened to this person when they started working in this UN organization. And the iterations are about successive things that happened over a period of time. So entirely fictional, sort of. Except in reality, there's a lot of projection going on there. People are writing about things which are of their own experience. At the end of the exercise, they carried out a survey, a, a, a literally a survey monkey survey of people. And one of the questions they ask is, which of these storylines do you think was most likely um, happen in reality? Which of these storylines are most desirable uh, or undesirable? So even though it was a fictional construct, in its, in its totality, the individual components of it are probably substantially less fictional, but these were then tested against the views of the audience. So um, that was one example. Um, and the other example is literally, I think I've already mentioned it, a think tank in the UK having a, scenario, um, a strategic planning exercise coming up and they wanted to do this exercise as an input. In fact, we did two exercises, an initial one with a small subset of people whereby the think tank just wanted to get comfortable with the idea of using the app and whether it, w whether it would be useful, a pretest essentially. They didn't want to risk time and resources on something that wasn't relevant to them or didn't work out in the way that they thought. So they did a pretest. They were happy with that. Then they went ahead where they carefully selected staff from across the organization and the, the, uh, the storyline, the, the initial starting paragraph was set in, uh, I think, the beginning of next year. And it, it looked over a period of about three or four years in six monthly um, iterations. Uh, and, uh, and that then fed into the subsequent existing scenario, a uh, strategic planning process. Great. There are other questions you had, but I can't Yeah, I see. Uh, just the, very quickly on the privacy, who gets to see the data when you set up the story? And then I have two questions from the chat that, uh, that sure. I, will, I will. Okay. So all participants are anonymous, except the facilitator does know who the participants are. The storylines themselves are only viewable by the participants unless the facilitator decides that they want to share uh, access to that interface that you saw with designated other observers or commentators. Yeah, great. Thank you, Rick. So uh, we have two questions posted in the chat. The first is to think about elaborating a little bit more on the, the sense-making part. Um, so uh, you had mentioned, you know, you need quite a bit of diversity in stories, but um, can you also aim for an overarching story? And how do you make sense of the various story, um, you know, the then what question in some way? So, um, yeah. Uh, right. Um, so the story, intrinsic, you're always going to end up with the, a number of surviving storylines, which equals the number of participants. So it's not like you're aiming for a particular outcome at the end. The whole idea is to generate a diversity of possibilities about the future. Um, sorry, I've I lost track of the other question. Um, uh, can you remind me of it again? Yeah, the other one is to is is just about the sense making of the different stories. Right. How do you classify them? How do okay. you end yeah. up okay, with a good. framework? Right. Okay. So I touched upon this partly in the evaluation questions. We've got a mixture of closed ended questions where I ask we where we ask the participants which of these storylines do you think is most likely, least likely, most. Um, uh, most desirable, uh, least desirable. So you're literally asking them to to to, to classify the storylines on criteria that you have identified as important. But the other question is a, what's called a pile or card sorting question, 
which is an open-ended ethnographic form of inquiry where you're asking people to sort the storylines into two piles of any size and then tell you what they think is the most significant difference between these storylines. And so here people will say, look, the most significant difference here is these are, these are uh, really well articulated, detailed storylines and these are quite superficial. We think these ones over here have been written by people who know what they're talking about and these ones don't. Or over here, these are really optimistic, these are really pessimistic. Um, so that's where the, the participants will, will be uh, doing the sense making themselves by, by, um, by doing that sorting. And we're going to build in um, some tagging opportunities which will also enable that to happen. Once you've got the data, uh, you can uh, then done um, network visualizations of the results of the pile sorting, which you can then look for, find, uh, do some more analysis of the pile sorting, not only just looking at the criteria that people have told you about, but the overlaps in the judgments of the different participants and the extent that that happens. Um, with those two scatter plots that you, disc that you saw, it's really important, I think, to be focusing on those two sort of uh, two quadrants: the desirable but unlikely, and the and the likely but undesirable. The storylines in those vicinities. It's like looking out the side window of a car rather than looking ahead. You're looking at opportunities and risks, and those storylines on either side. They're ones that where you would want to have a subsequent discussion with with key with key relevant people you think are important about your you know. If that's a risk, what are we going to do about it? Could, can we forfend the risk or can we respond after the event to the event when it happens? Likewise with the opportunities, is there anything we can anticipate do in advance to make it more likely? Um, so that sort of classificatory structure gives you a way of focusing on particular storylines. Likewise, if you, if you did a scatter plot of equity against uh, sustainability, you, that would, again would I think help you uh, focus in on particular storylines that you then wanted to see how you would respond to those. Thank you, Rick. Last question before uh, I, I see some other questions are coming, but we'll we'll turn to them after Olena because I want to make sure that we we also have plenty of time. So, last question before we move to Olena is how you combine or can you most likely you can combine with the most significant change uh, stories? Um, can you embed them uh, in the different scenarios? Uh, can you can you uh, how how do they fit together? Um, I haven't tried to do that and I can't quite see how it could be done, but what I can say is this, uh, this the kernel of this idea behind this app came out of the same PhD research on organizational learning that most significant change came out of. I originally did a classroom exercise, face-to-face -face exercise uh, using the Power Evo idea in 1996 in Wales and then put the idea aside for quite a few years <laughs> and have now implemented it. So they have a common research origins but I can't, haven't and I can't see quite how I could combine them at the moment. You may have some ideas. Well, you can ponder on that and then we'll turn to Marco's question uh, after, after Olena um... Uh, has presented um, and we'll have we'll have plenty of time for further interaction and maybe you can also show us a bit more of the of the tool. Um, 